Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of John, the eighth chapter, beginning with verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Then the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, because I know where I have come from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. Yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is valid. For it is not I alone who judge, but I am the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is valid. I testify on my own behalf, and the Father who sent me testifies on my behalf. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while he was teaching in the treasury of the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. You may be seated. I first just want to say good morning and how excited I am to be here um, to join in the life and the ministries of this congregation and to get to know all of you better. So I just want to say that first. But this time is not about me, so let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. We read from the gospel today, but we're going to begin with the book of Exodus. It's in the book of Exodus that we hear the story of Moses and God's people in their journey to the promised land. Before their journey began, they lived as slaves under Pharaoh. Then, with the help of Moses and after ten plagues, God freed them sending them through the desert wilderness to the promised land. As God led the Hebrews from Egypt, God made a promise, a promise to protect them and guide them. By day, God would lead them with a pillar of cloud. By night, God would lead them with a pillar of light, of fire. In the dark of night, God would guide them. They wouldn't need to worry about what hid in the night of the wilderness. They wouldn't need to worry about where to go or which way to turn. All they had to do was follow the light of God. So now let's fast forward about 50-ish generations back into the Gospel of John. When the great second temple rules over the city of Jerusalem, watches over it. There in Jerusalem, Jesus and his followers have come to join in the Festival of Booths, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, for first century Jews, back in the time of Jesus, this festival is one of the biggest celebrations of the year. For seven days, the Jewish people celebrate God's abiding presence in the wilderness with their ancestors. Though their ancestors often lost trust in God's protection, God never left them. So every year, the first century Jews gather in Jerusalem, sleep in tents, also known as booths, that represent God's protection. And they participate in rituals that celebrate how God provided water in the desert for their ancestors. 
And just as the ancient Hebrews followed God day and night, so do the first century Jews remember, worship, and celebrate day and night for seven days. It's a big party. And to keep this big party going through the night, Jerusalem needs light, right? So in the temple's court of women, which is one part of the temple, that has an area of over 3,000 meters, young priests in training climb ladders to massive candelabra in each corner with 10 gallons of oil for each corner. They light the giant lamps. And as the Mishnah describes, the light from the candelabra is so bright that there is not a courtyard in Jerusalem that is not illuminated. The temple lit up the whole city. It was inescapable. And it is in this powerful light that Jesus speaks this week's I am statement. For seven days, Jesus and his followers have celebrated and worshipped. And for seven days, Jewish leaders, such as the Pharisees, have tried to arrest him. So far, they failed in arresting him for breaking God's laws, but not for a lack of trying. They argue with him. They ask him trick questions. They try for a gotcha moment. But they don't understand who they're arguing with. In John chapter 8, in the middle of another potential gotcha moment, Jesus speaks, kind of seemingly out of the blue. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness but will have the light of life. In the temple's great light that turns night into day, Jesus proclaims that he is the source of God's light. The same light that guided Israel through the wilderness continues in Jesus, God incarnate, the one who guides humanity through the spiritual wilderness and through fear and worry, the one who frees Israel and all humankind from the oppression of death, the one who is the light of life. The Jewish, the Jewish leaders who see Jesus standing in this light, who hear him proclaim that he is the light of the world, believe that Jesus is trying to be the opposite of God's law. That Jesus is trying to lead God's people away from God's law. For in the history of God's people, the law has served as God's light. Think of Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a guide unto my path. So they fear that Jesus leads his followers away from God's law, from God's truth, from God's love. They completely miss that Jesus is actually the fulfillment of God's law. The one drawing people deeper into God's light of life. Jesus, as the light of the world, calls his followers to live in that light, to live in his life, light. Jesus calls them to follow the light of the world who sits with sinners, to follow the light of the world who feeds the hungry, both in body and in spirit. Jesus calls his followers to follow the light of the world who comforts the distressed, cares for, and even heals the sick, weeps with the mourners, and forgives the betrayers. That light of life that guided Israel through the desert wilderness and that became human like us 2,000 years ago is the light that continues with us today. 
the very same light. The Holy Spirit surrounds us and fills us with God's light, guiding us through our wildernesses. When we fear where to go, when we forget how to trust God, when following God just seems impossible, when the night surrounds us, the Spirit guides us. She goes before us as a pillar of fire, and she lights up the night like four giant lamps that we may live as God, our di divine parent, wants us and calls us to live. The Holy Spirit feeds us when we're hungry and equips us to feed others. She comforts us when we're distressed and guides us to comfort others. She cares for us when we're sick and calls us to care for others in their sickness. She weeps with us and leads us to journey with others as they weep. She forgives us when we trespass against her, and she pushes us to forgive those who trespass against us. She moves within us, lighting a flame of God's light within us so that God's light never leaves us and so that we may always act with the light of God. God's light of love is ready to burst from us through our words and deeds and even just our presence. God is ready for us to let the light of the world guide us. Now, each of us can speak to the challenges of following Jesus, to following the light of the world. Sometimes not following Jesus is a whole lot easier than following Jesus. It's just true. Sometimes following Jesus is scary. As Jesus leads us into the unknown or leads us into dangerous spaces, sometimes following Jesus makes no sense and we wonder why he calls us into something so foolish. But Jesus is the light of the world who protects us as he guides us. While we hesitate, while we fear, while we complain, while we argue with God, God never forsakes us. Let us follow the light of the world, follow the light of life, for it will only lead us into love, into healing, into community, into joy. God is with us. The light of the world is among us and within us. But how often do we not see that light? When have we missed the light of the world standing right in front of us, declaring to us, I am the light of the world? How often do we refuse to see the light of God in others? We began relationships and conversations with judgment rather than curiosity. We expect the worst, assume that the other is wrong and that we are right. We look for sin rather than look for love. We look for human folly rather, to, rather than divine wisdom. We ask trick questions. We argue. We hope for the perfect gotcha. We focus on winning the argument rather than seeing God in our neighbor. What would it mean to begin with curiosity? To look for God's light in our adversaries? Would it soften our hearts? Open our hearts? Remind us that they are like us and we are like them? broken, yet redeemed. 
what would it mean if we began by looking how the Holy Spirit moves in their hearts? By asking what wilderness they are walking through. By believing that God beckons them to walk in the light just as God beckons us to walk in the light. That's no easy task. It's really, really hard when we see others who have hurt us, others who are hurting others. But when we live in the light of the world, we share the light of the world, and we always look for where the light is showing up, even when it's where we least expect it. May each of us, may all of us, follow God's light. May we allow the light to lead us where we need to go, to guide us through the wilderness, to teach us how to love, to show us how to live with the perfect love of God. May we follow the light of the world so that we may never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen.